much. I thought I was here because my colleague Martin doesn't speak. He just opens the door, then he sends his CEO. <laughs> yeah, but they came back to the office and they were relating the story and they said, wow, you know, this guy, Junai, he's so trusting. He just opened the door and let us into his house. <laughs> Yeah, and we, we thank God for such believers of great faith. <laughs> uh, but thank you for having me. Um, really, I mean, family is on my heart, and uh, we are always very privileged when we are invited by any church, you know, to come and share God's word, uh, particularly on the family. Um, and actually, that's the only thing I speak on nowadays. Um, I don't know how you uh, came here this morning. Um, I know all of us are believers, right? And today is the, the Lord's day. And so I'm, I'm sure we probably, you know, woke up really, really early in the morning, you know, to spend our own personal quiet time with the Lord. We have our own personal sweet worship. And the, the sweet sounds of maybe our voice wafted through the air, floated through our entire uh, home and began to wake up our family members one by one. We didn't have to rush anybody out of bed. And, you know, as we got uh, our breakfast and prepared to come to church, Right? We exchange loving gestures and loving words uh, to one another. Sounds right? Or maybe it sounds a little bit more like this, which perhaps uh, was my day a little bit. Uh, maybe on route here, you know, you already had to kind of um, uh, uh, go through lots of traffic. I, I recall coming here uh, every single, uh, and I'm, uh, it was really literally every single traffic light I came to was red. You're asking, how difficult could it be to come to a church? Uh, and, and maybe that was uh, your day, your morning, just coming here. And uh, perhaps today is the end of a very long week of sleep deprivation. You actually rushed to get out of bed, you know, uh, felt a little bit disgruntled having to come to church early on a Sunday morning when, you know, this is the only day you could uh, sleep in. Uh, maybe... You know, you were already feeling a little bit grouchy because you had to drag a grouchy, you know, be it spouse or child or teenager, uh, out of bed to make them come to church or at least, you know, wake up to sit with you to watch the service online for those of you who are online, right? And maybe in the process of doing all that, um, instead of loving words and gestures, you kind of already exchanged some impatient, maybe slightly harsh words with your spouse. I don't know about you, but really, honestly, I think if we were to ask the normal everyday person, they'd probably tell you that that sounds like what family is on a daily basis. You know, we know that doing family today, especially, isn't easy, right? We definitely want to build strong relationships with our family members. We want our children to grow up well. But especially today in our modern society, when expectations run really high with the demands and stresses of modern life, with the pace of digitalized living, it's not easy, right? And I think the news headlines kind of say it all. I'm sure you've seen some of them. Mental health issues today are the buzzword, uh, assailing even our very young, unfortunately. Uh, then, of course, we have um, things like this. Sex that we know God intended for marriage has been taken out of its protective boundaries and context with very dire implications. Or how about this? Marriage that was once regarded as a lifelong institution without question is today perhaps treated a little bit more as a lifestyle choice. Something we can, you know, choose when to do it, whether or not, you know, um, it should come with children. Or sexuality that we know forms an integral part of God's design for humankind. Today has been manipulated and distorted. You know, family that is intended to be the first place we receive we understand and we give love is now being devalued and even redefined, even in our nation. This is why actually Focus on the Family Singapore exists. We celebrate, uh, as Chula has mentioned, our 20th year this year. But instead of witnessing family life becoming easier, family relationships becoming stronger, um, especially with the blessings of a very prosperous, first world, efficient city nation that we are. 
we find actually our work at Focus on the Family, and for me, almost 20 years at Focus on the Family, uh, instead of getting better, getting easier, actually increasing, and in fact, intensifying. Yes, there are families in crisis, individuals in need, but today, even the everyday family, normal people like you and me, right, um, who are not necessarily in crisis or in great need, but even everyday folks like us, we need encouragement and support regularly when it comes to family life. You know, in relational health as with physical health, prevention is actually better than cure. And rather than tackling the issue when relationships have already gone sour, marriages are already you know, broken down in disrepair, it's so much better if you could go upstream. And that's something that Focus on the Family seeks to do. Uh, I want to just uh, even have a, as the opportunity to come here to visit City Missions Church to just share with you a couple of things that we do. Uh, we do three things actually in going, trying to go upstream. One of which is to promote, promote family through relevant programs such as our webinars, our workshops, through signature events such as Date With That, which uh, maybe some of you have heard of, or our newly pivoted, because we can't have you know, on-site Date With That events anymore, newly pivoted parent tween rite of passage, through timely resources in both print and today digitalized format, such as our parent ad podcast, through things like our family campaigns. We just finished our marriage campaign. We want to seek to inspire and to equip everyday families to strengthen relationships starting at home. You know, if really we have strong relationships at home, perhaps we can also better relate when we go to work. If we have better relationships with our colleagues and maybe even our bosses. The second thing that we try to do apart from promote is to protect. You know, understanding the times that we live in, we know that family is being challenged and we want to uphold the timeless institutional family and trusted family values, biblical family values, by providing thoughtful local research and analytical insights to counter the many trends that seek to undo God's design. And last but not least, partner. We want to build lasting marriages and thriving parent-child relationships by collaborating with like-minded people, like-minded organizations, be they churches or maybe community organizations, schools, uh, even corporates. And what we want to do with them to journey you know, with families needing support, to partner them to provide whether it's counseling and coaching or maybe to train uh, individuals up, including young people, to believe in, to live out and champion family. And one of the things that we have discovered with our youth work um, is that young people whom today we think don't really care very much about family actually do if they are given a chance. And I want to show you a short video clip of uh, one of our latest programs uh, that we pivoted because of COVID and it's called the 1825 Collective. Uh, let me play the video for you and let's hope it plays. Why should my generation care about family and marriages? Well, first of all, if we think about how we want to build a nation using that kind of language, family and marriages are then the building blocks and the glue that holds our nation together. It has definitely broadened my view to talking about such topics because I think sometimes we can almost talk about dating and relationships in silo almost like it's a separate activity from everything else that you do but I think the entire 1825 has really given me a more holistic view on how sexuality also affects like my personal sexuality affects all the relationships in my life
You know, one of the things we've realized is that when we teach young people, you know, what family is all about, uh, what relationships are supposed to be like, um, but don't just teach them up here head knowledge, but allow them, you know, to experience it, uh, to live it out. Uh, they can truly become champions, advocates of God's design for family. Um, recently, I don't know if you uh, caught sight of this, uh, but recently there was actually an article uh, that was uh, going around social media uh, criticizing MOE's sexuality education program, um, saying that, you know, why is it so, in a way, archaic that it's only promoting heterosexual marriages and nuclear, strong nuclear families? Uh, it should be more inclusive. Uh, but anyway, part of this article, um, they didn't fail, you know, to somehow drag focus on the family uh, into the whole picture. You know, we had nothing to do with it. And, and ever since, you know, the, uh, what's called the, I think today, the Aware Saga in 2009, we've not actually been back into schools to conduct sexuality education programs. Uh, but we were conducting uh, what was called an, a relationship program. And way back in 2014, an incident happened, I'm not sure if uh, any of you recall it, uh, but an incident happened for us where a student in one of our local JCs where we were conducting you know, these workshops and uh, the workshop was actually uh, something that was um, not just uh, uh, funded, but it was actually commissioned by you know, the ministry um, for us to go in and teach young people, uh, inculcate in them you know, a vision for healthy relationships in the hope that actually this was in conjunction with uh, what we know as this called the social development network. Okay, in the hopes that if I introduce young people to the good of relationships and you know, give them some handles how to uh, you know, treat the opposite sex and, and get along with them, uh, there is hope that they will get married you know, and get married earlier and of course um, form families and perhaps you know, help counter Singapore's uh, fertility issue. Um, and anyway, so, you know, we were, each year at that point of time, we were running uh, maybe close to 30 to maybe 50 workshops at any one time, especially during the post-exam period. And so one of the workshops in this particular school had one student, you know, who, who didn't like what she was hearing in the workshop, and therefore she wrote what's called, uh, what she called an open letter to her principal, essentially just uh, put it out on Facebook. And um, it became viral and it caught the attention, of course, of the press and it became a whole PR nightmare for us, you know, and uh, as, a, as a result, um, yeah, um, we, we, I mean, we had, to deal, we, we had to deal with a lot of bad press at the point of time and so, you know, it was kind of assumed that due to this incident, um, our relationship program was called to an end. You know, but actually, to set the record straight, and this is something that you know, we, we haven't had much opportunity to tell people, but actually to set the record straight, this student, uh, I think you might be able to see her name there, actually it was not her or her letter that resulted in the termination of that program. Earlier that year, this happened in October, but earlier that year, we had already been notified by the ministry you know, that there were some issues about us going in to conduct the program when you know, MOE has their own sexuality education program, which also covers this aspect of relationship. And so they had already notified us earlier in the year that you know, this, because this is going to be the last round. Yeah, and after this run, you know, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to do this program anymore, so we don't need focuses services anymore. And in fact, because we were notified earlier in the year, uh, we started to really get down on our knees and pray and think and ideate. And, and we were asking this question, if we can no longer go into schools, you know, to seed some of these godly values, um, what are we going to do, right? How are we still going to get uh, in touch with the young people? How are we still going to reach them? And so the idea of uh, what is today known as Fam Champs, of which the video you just saw is one of the programs, uh, it came up. Uh, at that point of time, our chairman, Jason Wong, um, he had this idea of like, you know, if young people could champion environmental causes, uh, champion animal rights or whatever it is, why can't they champion family? You know, and so he, uh, with that little challenge that he posed to the team, the team you know, crafted what became um, a, a camp, a four-day, four day, three-night camp for young people, you know, for students to come together, uh, to learn about family, um, to experience what family life is supposed to be, but what it looks like today in reality, you know, get some handles on how to better relate, especially to their parents, right? And, and to uh, cast a vision for them, for what 
their future family could look like, regardless of their present circumstances. And I must say that, you know, despite the fact that this incident with the school um, happened in early October, 10th of October, in fact, two weeks later, we launched Fam Champs. Truly by God's grace. You know, the schools that heard about, you know, this bad press, basically, that we were having, dropped us for the relationship program. You know, but all but one school who agreed to come on board our Fam Champs program stayed with us. They sent their students. And that was the beginning of Fam Chance, which today is in its eighth year. You know, we can have a student, you know, one student like uh, Agatha Tan, you know, and say that, wow, she got so much power. But actually, no, our God actually has more power. But contrary to one student such as her, there are many others who are a bit more like this one, Tessa Ho. There was another side of to this story when the incident happened in 2014. Tessa was one of the few students uh, who were brave enough, who did not agree with what Agatha wrote, right? And actually, you know, who knew many, many other students, majority of whom actually did not agree with Agatha's experience. They actually appreciated the workshop. They thought it was a breath of fresh air, um, but. Agatha, uh, Tessa was one of the very few students who dared to also write openly her take on the workshop that she attended in another school, but same workshop. You know, of course, as a result of that, she got flagged. Yeah, um, she faced a lot of, uh, including threats. Yeah, and when we came to know of her a couple of years later, uh, that's only when we found out you know, the amount of pressure that she was going through. We didn't know who she was. We just picked up that, wow, you know, there's this student who is countering what Agatha is saying. And Tessa is actually one uh, of the young people, young adults, who graduated from our very first batch of the 1825 collective that you just saw in the video just now. It was really amazing, right? Uh, Elder July shared about how even I came here to your church today, this morning. But it's really amazing how our God works. And particularly when it comes to family. And I believe it's largely because family is a big thing on God's heart. Because He knows that's actually where all of us first derive our identity. That's where we form our values. Like I said, family is supposed to be a place where we first learn to um, not just give love, but actually to receive love. And in fact, that's where we understand, you know, truly what God, the Father's love, is supposed to be like, especially within the context of a Christian family. You know, one of the uh, verses that we hold dear, sorry, this is Tessa, um, and graduating from our Fam Champs Collective. You know, but one of the verses uh, that focus on the family has uh, constantly, you know, been given by various ones. You know, we would have like a retreat or maybe somebody who's praying for us. And they, uh, we've been receiving this verse over the years multiple times. Uh, the verse from 1 Chronicles 12, 32, to be like the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. There are two parts to this verse that I think, you know, gives us a clue as to how family could be so much more as God has designed it. One of which is the thinking part, to understand. Understand exactly what God's instruction for good family life is, is supposed to be like, right? To understand God's heart for moms, for dads who are, as you saw in the earlier statistics, local statistics, very stressed, uh, facing mom guilt, now got dad guilt as well, right? When we understand God's heart for the children, you know, wanting them to grow up in the ways of the Lord. But apart from right thinking, there's also the second part of the verse, what we ought to do, right doing. Now we know that uh, in James, right, it says, do not merely listen to the word, don't be doers of the word, or, uh, don't be hearers of the word only, but to do the word, right? Because anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in the mirror, and then after looking at himself, goes away, immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, so if we understand God's law, God's commands, but we don't just... Or understand, you know, one year in, one year out, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I hit knowledge, lip service, but we actually do it and continue living it out. 
not forgetting what we've heard, but doing it, right? We will be blessed in what we do. And I think that is really the key for great family, which God promises to all of us. Just two very simple keys, right thinking and right doing. But somehow, family as we know has gone wrong. Right? We know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it started with when God created mankind in his own image, he created them male and female. Right? Male and female with very different bodies, different ways even our brain are wired, and neuroscience will tell us that, different ways that we respond to situations, different ways we tend to relate even to other people, and even different ways um, we respond sexually. But it's not just things that have gone wrong with family. Things have gone wrong with sex itself. You know, when I first joined Focus, this was 20 years ago, right? Um, our flagship program was a sexuality education program. And one of the first questions we asked is, why do young people have sex? And I remember, you know, in one of the first workshops that I conducted after I was trained to do the program, uh, a, a teenage boy, Christian, mind you, okay, came up and he, you know, said to my husband and I who were conducting the program that he had sex with a girl, you know, and we asked him, okay, so, so how did it happen? And he said, it just happened, you know, then we said, how, how, what do you mean by just happened? You mean like, it's not like you walk down the road with your, your girlfriend and then you, oh, trip, fall, and oh, oh, I didn't realize it, we just had sex. No, it's not like that, right? Okay, then he started to expound. Oh, he wanted to impress his girlfriend, so he invited his girlfriend to come to his house so he can cook you know, a meal for the girlfriend. And his parents were not home, and so after the meal, they sat on the sofa, and one thing led to another, and before they knew it, right, um, they had sex. I mean, it didn't just happen. It was a series of events. Um, if he was really thinking about it, maybe it might not have just happened. Right? And similarly, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, if we think that we are standing firm, be careful that we don't fall. No temptation has overtaken us except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, He will provide us a way out. You know, God knows our human weaknesses and frailty. In fact, he knows it so well that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's where you have uh, uh, Paul saying, right, to the unmarried and the widows, I say this, it's good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, because I know like, as humans, we've got some passions, right? Uh, some desires. If we cannot control ourselves, we should get married. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Right? It's not God, I think, understands that when He wired us, when He created us, right? He created us to have you know, sexual desires, to respond with our bodies even sexually. Uh, but He didn't just create us with a sexual organ, He created us also with a brain, right? <laughs> to think about what, uh, how sex should be conducted within the context or confines of marriage. But you know, we know that even when it comes to marriage, things have gone really, really wrong. I mean, think about it. Why are div divorce rates so high and continue to rise when we know in Matthew chapter 19 and we hear it all the time in weddings, right? In the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And then we always say, right? What God has put together, let no man put asunder. We know it. And of course, in that same passage in Matthew 19, actually, the disciples asked Jesus, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And then Jesus' reply was this, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. See, that was not God's intent. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. Actually, my husband took that literally because he came from a family of divorce. Right? So many of his uh, uncles and his uh, parents included who divorced that, you know, when he and I first got together, right? And we, here I was thinking that, you know, we're going to get married. But to my, to my then boyfriend, he thought like, if get married, then end up divorced, better not to get married. Okay, but it's not supposed to be taken literally like that. Okay? And you can have a check, my husband. He has obviously uh, gotten his thinking around it that it was a purely commitment issue. And today we've been happily married for 21 years. 
<laughs> okay, but you know, we know all this, right? Um, we know that God intended marriage to be lifelong, but it's just gone wrong. Even with the kids, it's gone wrong. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 4. It says, children, obey your parents, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What better promise, right? Long life. And at the same time, not just the children, he, the fathers, the parents are also addressed. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Maybe mothers also. Mothers, do not exasperate your children by constantly nagging. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You know, the word is very clear, right? We have the information. In fact, um, we have this really, really clear instructions for Christian households. If you read the Bible, in certain versions of the Bible, they actually now put a subheader there. And it's called instructions for Christian households. Uh, this particular passage in the Bible has become controversial actually today. I'm sure we all know it, right? In Ephesians 5. Uh, the passage where it says, you know, wives submit to your husbands, uh, husbands love your wives. And oftentimes we miss out the very first verse in that whole passage in verse 21 where it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Oftentimes husbands will just quote to their wives, you must respect me. And similarly, wives just quote to their husbands, you must love me, right? And then we use it against each other and we say, husband, if you don't, if you don't love me, how can I respect you? And similarly, the husband says to the wife, right? I mean, we see this in our counseling rooms all the time. Sometimes not even in counseling rooms, right? We see this when sometimes we talk to couples. Uh, so similarly, the, the husband will say to wife, wife, you know, if you don't respect me, don't expect me to show you love. Right? And then it becomes of, okay, if both like that, who's to break this like vicious cycle? It's interesting, you know, because um, one of the things that my, both my husband and I do, we are, we are marriage solemnizers. And, and recently, I had this couple, a Christian couple, but, you know, for various reasons, uh, they couldn't get married uh, in their church or by their, ch their, by their church pastor. And so, um, you know, I conducted their solemnization, but they wanted a Christian wedding, <laughs> right? A Christian wedding, like how, how we would, you typically conduct, you know, uh, weddings in the church, like there's worship, preceded by worship, there's sharing of uh, some uh, part of some word from the uh, 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 Bible, right, to kind of exhort them as they embark on their journey into marriage. And um, they were very clear. They said, can you uh, share a passage from the Bible for us? Uh, but can it not be Ephesians chapter 5? <laughs> you know, and, and when they said that, you know, I, I didn't know whether to laugh or to get angry, to tell them off, <laughs> you know, but uh, I mean, of course, they, they tried to explain that, oh, because they have some uh, non-Christian guests in the midst, their parents are not all are believers, and so they might misunderstand this passage when they hear it, and you know, of course, they had their reasons, but don't you think it's really sad that what the Bible has made so clear as instructions for how we can have great family life. Somehow, you know, we find all kinds of excuses to rationalize how maybe it is not so today anymore. Why isn't family so much more? Why isn't family even as God intended? And, you know, I was reading recently the temptation of Jesus, you know, the 40 days when the devil came and tempted him. And I think it kind of lends a little bit of insight or understanding as to why many individuals are not experiencing family life and relationships the way they are supposed to be. And the first one, I think, is when it comes to basic instincts. You know, the first thing that Jesus was tempted, right, is because of the fact that he was hungry. We all have basic instincts or um, appetites, including sexual appetites, right? If you take the, the story of the, the, the young teenage uh, boy, you know, who, who shared what happened to him, um, it's really just acting on basal instinct. I was attracted, you know, I was aroused, and so one thing led to another, and without thinking, before I knew it, I had sex, right? Or maybe, you know, it's not even as uh, with such dire or potential dire consequences. Maybe it's just, 
us being stressed, just being overworked in modern society, uh, trying to cope with the languishing that COVID has presented to us. And so because of that, we tend to be snappy, we short-circuit relationships, not just the brain, but we short-circuit relationships, we try to shortcut, right? Um, and without really maybe intending to, but we end up disrespecting our husband or acting unlovingly towards our wife. Just simply because, you know, we are acting out of our natural physiological drives. When we fail to think and just act. I think the second aspect of it is when our aspirations, our ambitions overtake what the Word of God says. You know, the second temptation that Jesus actually was faced with was when the devil said to him, you know, look at all these, you know, I can give you the power, the glory, the fame of all these kingdoms, right? And I think that, you know, worldly aspirations, human ambitions, not the godly ambitions, but human ambitions can really get in the way of family. If you look at the statistics of the headlines, right, when we uh, try to look into or research, why aren't people wanting to get married or have children or have more children? The reasons we start to hear are too busy la, with career to settle down, right? I want to give my best years not to making babies. I want to give my best years to making money. Or sometimes, right, we might decide that, you know, in the office, I am boss. And so when we come home, we use our boss status to lord over our family, which we know is not how leadership at home works. Right? But it's really because the worldly aspirations and, and what the drive you know, that comes from the, the world starts to creep into the home and into relationships. Or maybe, you know, when, when you ask parents why they don't have uh, more kids, or you ask young couples, why is it that they prefer to have, uh, now I, I know they're called um, dogs as they are kids, la. <laughs> or fur kids as they call them, right? Why do you prefer fur kids rather than human kids, right? And sometimes couples will tell you, uh, not, not because, you know, they're having difficulty um, uh, conceiving, but they'll tell you that, you know, to bring up a child in Singapore is very expensive, you know. If you calculate how much a parent needs to spend on enrichment classes alone, right? And some of these reasons, they, they seem well and noble, but when you think about it, it's because we also kind of bought in to what the world deems good parenting or good life should be like, right? I mean, if you think in our day and age growing up, um, not many enrichment classes to go to anyway. Do have all these things that, you know, parents today, we ferry our children to and fro from, right? Yeah, and so because of that, you know, we might be, in fact, overthinking, Okay, this one is not that we don't think, we do think, but we think and we, our thinking starts to get, you know, into the worldly way of thinking. But the third and last temptation that Jesus faced in the desert was in the area of his emotions. If you recall, you know, uh, Jesus was a really um, challenged, right? He said, you know, the devil said, you know, you throw yourself down lah. And then you, you see what God will do for you, right? Because since he's so powerful, um, test the Lord in this. And so thus Jesus' response was, you shall not test the Lord. You know, but I think this points to how many of us sometimes, you know, it's this almost like we live our lives like truth or dare. <laughs> test la, Try la, Whether it's for thrill or maybe it's the total exact opposite. We are scared. Right out of fear, kiasu, ah. <laughs> kiasu, kiasi, right? And, and so we operate, not with thinking, not even with just doing, but we really operate just out of feeling. And when we do something like that, this is when we realize that it's not going to allow us to experience family in that so much more way that God desires for us to experience it. You know, the heart particularly, as it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, right? So whatever it is, don't use your emotions as a starting point, okay? What we need is some right thinking, fueled or informed by the Word of God, 
And then actually, not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well, right? Doing, to actually live it out. And in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 17 to 24, let me read this out. It says this, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. We have been taught the ways of the Lord. We have been given instructions for living life, including instructions for Christian households. And what have we been taught? With regard to our former way of life, verse 22, it says, to put off our old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Instead, to be made new in the attitude of our minds, right thinking, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, right doing. And so it boils down to this very basic question, bottom line. Bottom line is this. Do we believe in the Word of God as the truth in directing all relationships in our life, including our family? Do we believe that the Word of God is the standard for marriages, for how husbands and wives are to relate? That the Word of God is the truth when it comes to how I should bring up my children and how children should relate to parents. If we believe in the Bible as the truth, as the instructions, then the other question is, will we live it out? Will we do it? If we do, God's word is clear. His promise, right? is always certain. And his promise is that when we do live out family with right thinking, right doing, he who is at work in us can accomplish, you know, I've given two versions up there on the slides, infinitely more. Or in the other version, immeasurably more than what we might ask or think. You know, we as humans, God knows our frailty. He knows that we are stressed. <laughs> he knows that COVID has taken a toll on many of us, right? But he doesn't just give us instructions and then waits there and tells us to do it and sits back and folds his arms, ready to just judge us. No, our God is a God who is at work within us, as this verse says. He is at work in us. He's going to empower us to do it. He's not just going to let us be and leave us alone, right? But just as how, I know some of us here are parents, right? As parents, you know, when we give an instruction to our child, especially if it's your first time doing it, a task, we don't just like, you go do it and then I just watch you lot, even if I know that you have potentially might fail and fall and hurt yourself, right? We're probably at the sidelines. We want them to learn independence, but they were kind of just like looking and like trying to resist from stepping in too early, but always ever ready to step in in case we need to quickly whip our child out of danger or save our child. Yeah, and that's God. He is constantly at work in us. Now, this morning, even before coming, um, one of my cell group members, he sent the, his, the devotional that really spoke to him. And when he sent it, I was thinking like, wow, you know, this is exactly it. You know, so many times we, we feel that families, we can't really fa say that family is so much more than we could also imagine. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Why? Because, you know, we, we live according to our basal instincts, our worldly aspirations, our feelings more than anything else. And, you know, when I was just reading what uh, this cell group member sent me, it was titled, My Parents Were Angry and Now I Am Too. And it's actually talk about how, you know, this person started losing their temper when their second child came along. And, you know, it was just over very, very little things. And of course, you know, it, it dawned on this person that it was because that was how he had experienced growing up. His parents were always angry. 
right? And so he began to like break all the generational curses and whatnot. Um, but you know, that's only one part to it, and definitely we need to do that, right? Uh, but the other part of it is that God showed up in his everyday life, and he realized that he needed to make some daily changes. And so one of the things he did, you know, whenever um, he felt compelled, you know, to lash out, he said, I felt the Holy Spirit compelling me instead to take a deep breath, speak slowly and carefully to my children, and seek out ways to bless them with my words throughout the day. When my sons napped, Okay, I prioritized then to be my spiritual growth time. I read up, read my Bible and all the Christian parenting books I could read. Um, I told myself that I need to start apologizing to my boys and study what it means to be humble. I kept a gratitude journal, writing down all the big and small ways that I was blessed and choosing to have a joyful heart instead of a complaining heart spirit. And, you know, it reminded me even of my own journey. Um, my family um, is a very critical family, particularly the women. <laughs> uh, very quick to not just evaluate, but also criticize. Yeah. And you know, it didn't take me long before I think even my husband realized that I was like that towards him. So if we take the passage from Ephesians chapter 5, right? <laughs> Why submit to your husbands? You know? And here I was, I, um, I thought very highly of myself. You know? I thought like, hey, I'm quite a smart person. You know? uh, I can do so many things, right? Yeah, and of course, you know, eventually taking over the leadership or focus on the family can have its downside, right? Uh, and so you know, I think like, I know all that is to family life, right? And yeah, my husband not doing this, my husband not doing that right. You know, my husband not doing parenting right or not being the right kind of father that our, our child needs um, is critical right and it came to a point I think it was our 10th uh, anniversary we decided to do you know what uh, all good marriage books tell you to do you should every now and then take a regular checkup on your on your marriage and so that's what my husband and I did we took a, a what's called the couple checkup I don't know what you're doing it's basically a relationship profiling assessment that we encourage couples even before getting married to do and so we decided to do it on our third year of uh, tenth year of marriage and here I was thinking like oh the results would be very good right um, um, except for the area of communication because I had already you know, critically analyzed that that was uh, not a very good area you know, in our marriage. There, were, there was room for improvement. Um, but you know, my husband happily rated our communication as very, very good. So even on that, profiling, we did not agree. And so we told, you know, when, we, when we got the report, we told ourselves, okay, let's go through the report together. You know, we'll have a date. We'll go to the botanic gardens and we'll go to the cafe, you know, in the like, nice surroundings of greenery and we'll sit down and we'll have, you know, nice um, uh, uh, coffee together or breakfast together. And then we'll spend that time talking through our report and what, you know, areas we can improve in our, our relationship. And we ended up arguing about <laughs> the interpretation, interpretation of the results. And, and here I was totally indignant because, you know, I was the psychology grad. I know how to read these kind of results. I know what they say. You know, here I was arguing, right? That I'm right. And of course, it took the Holy Spirit to convict me that, you know, what's the point of being right here when you're not really thinking very rightly about, you know, your role as a wife? Nor are you behaving very correctly in wanting to be, you know, the godly wife, the woman of Proverbs 31, right? And it took a lot of humility, I must say, for me to like tell myself, or maybe God rebuking me as well, that so much of being so smart, you're not that smart, if you can't even figure this out, if you can't even realize that. The simple thing here would be to acknowledge that you're just different. As the whole profile says, you are actually, you know, ever since we got married, every single personality profile that my husband and I have done, we've always been on extreme opposites. You know, I think this is really God's way. Just now we sang the song, right? Melt me, mold me. <laughs> I think this is really God's way of melting me, molding me. But you know, when we really want to adopt the right thinking and right doing in our family life, God can and will do so much more than we could ask or imagine. You know, I want to end today um, praying for some of us. I know um, many of you probably have been in the faith for quite 
some time now. And perhaps the challenge is more in you know, your family members and um, feeling a burden that they are not thinking right nor living right. Um, perhaps they've fallen away even from the faith. You know? and, and today, I just want to stand with you and pray with you. It is God's desire. And God will honour your prayers because there's actually nothing more powerful than the, the prayers of a parent. Okay, maybe that is. It's the prayers of the spouse. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> next to it, the prayers of a parent. Yeah, and I want to just stand with you. Um, and maybe it could even be your spouse. Okay, perhaps, you know, you, you came to the faith after you got married and, and you've been waiting and praying all these years for your spouse to also come to know the Lord. And it's been just dismal, you know, but um, I want to stand with you that, that God will continue to grant you grace and strength as you press on to think right, follow his commandments and live it out. Think right and do right and allow him, you know, to do much more than you could ever ask or imagine in your family. Okay, and I also I want to pray for those of you who are in that uh, place right now. And maybe for uh, some others here, you know, even listening today, you might think that I think I have a disconnect between the thinking and doing. Okay, I know everything the Bible says, right? But uh, sometimes I think in this modern life, not so applicable. Not true. Not true, right? It's our worldly thinking that is a worldly aspirations that's taking over. Yeah, but if there is a disconnect that, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit is already kind of placing a finger on today. Um, and, and maybe you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable because, you know, even me as a Christian, you are really strong in the faith. You're going out there. You believe totally in evangelism and outreach and discipling others in the church. But back at home, things are not quite, you know, so wholesome so holy, so glorifying, and you know that. Maybe other people don't, but you do. Yeah, if that's you, I also want to pray with you and for you. Yeah, I know it's not easy, um, and just, you know, as the devotional today and as I shared, it takes some humility sometimes, <laughs> and it takes some changes in how we behave, maybe in our lifestyle habits, it takes some controlling, biting the tongue, if you are like me, so that we are not critical and we don't act out of the flesh, yeah, but allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. But it's not impossible. Yeah, and so I want to pray for you. Okay, so um, let's just close and let me pray. Father, I just thank you that you know you indeed want us to each experience family so much more immeasurably more, infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine. And I know family is tough. Everyday family life is tough. And I want to stand here a lot today with my brothers and sisters um, who are, you know, have been just um, um, travailing maybe in prayer and just, you know, getting discouraged because they have been submitting their request to just want to see a turnaround, a breakthrough in your family life, in your relationships, maybe in specific family members, Lord, but yet to have see that breakthrough. Lord, I want to pray and stand with them, Lord. God, you hear their prayers. And you know, God, what is best for their family members. God, you know how best to also answer their prayers, Lord, in your own way and in your perfect timing. I want to pray for an increased measure of faith in our, my brothers and sisters who are in that situation, that they will not give up, that they will continue to have hope, that they will press on, that they will persevere. And Lord, that they will continue to just think right and live right, that they would be that testimony that will not fail to have an impression and impact on the family members that they want to see the turnaround in their lives. So Lord, we stand with them today and we ask and beseech this of you because you are a prayer answering God and we know you will answer. We thank you, Lord. And Father, I also want to pray uh, for the other uh, uh, people in the room, Lord, the other brothers and sisters who may be struggling with that disconnect between right thinking and right doing, especially when it comes to family life. Lord, I want to pray, God, that you would come in and you would renew our minds, Lord. 
Lord, help us to have a fresh understanding and a fresh conviction of your word and your commands and your instructions for our family life, for how we are supposed to do relationships. And Lord, help us to have the humility and to have the discipline, Lord, to change the way we behave and act. Lord, such that some of these relationships can be mended, can be restored. Lord, can again begin to function according and in alignment with your word. Now, if today you are online, uh, I know if you're online, it's a little bit more difficult, but if you're online and, you know, if either of this um, speaks to you, you're in either category, um, I would like to encourage you, yeah, contact the church. Get someone to pray with you. You know, we just, I just shared, right, how family, everyday family life can be so tough. Don't go it alone. Okay, whatever it is, don't go it alone. Please contact somebody in the church, you know, to stand with you, to pray with you, even if it's just to encourage you, to check in on you that you're still okay, you're still holding fast to God's word and still trying your best to live it out faithfully. Okay, and if it's because maybe you are in disconnect, also please contact the church. Sit down, talk to somebody. Maybe they can help sort out the disconnect between your thinking and your doing. Yeah, and if today uh, you're here on site, yeah, um, as we close the service, um, if you feel led, you know, I, like I said, I'd like to stand with you, but not just like in lip service, like, but to really stand and pray alongside with you if you would allow me to and you would like me to. Okay, so um, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be the worship team that comes up again. Okay, uh, but if that's you, yeah, and you like to be prayed for, I, I know your church allows uh, you to come forward and there's uh, the markings on the floor so that we can uh, continue to also obey the law. <laughs> the law of the land that we will live in, okay? Okay, so uh, with that, uh, let me hand the time back to the worship team. <laughs>